Okay, well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, May edition of the Series and Dallas uh, sessions. Uh, we've been doing this for uh, three or four years now, so thank you very much for joining us. Today, we have uh, a little bit of a, of a different topic that has been really hot, uh, and we've been working on that for the past couple of months, and it was kind of like a, a very early um, uh, edge topic a couple of months ago, but things have blown up quite a bit since. So today we definitely need to uh, talk about uh, generative AI. So today we're going to be doing a step-by-step -step tutorial with our guest and to teach you how to become a master of uh, chat GPT and mid-journey. I'm going to let him tell you all about this. But first and foremost, a little bit of an introduction. So we are obviously thanking our partners as usual, Slalom for sponsoring us for the past several years as well as Precocity, uh, who have been like fantastic partners with us, allowing us to bring in this content by service design for the past four years now. A uh, very quick introduction. I am Greg Lacluvi from Slalom, and we have Brenda from Precocity, uh, Christopher Robin Roberts from Capital One, and Brenda from Gen Financial. So we are the service design network. We are in Dallas, but we have kind of like taking over a little bit more of a, of a bigger footprint over the years. Um, this is going to be recorded. If you are missing it or you want to send it to somebody who may want to have that in their lives, uh, definitely go to our YouTube channel, Service and Network, the last chapter, and you can see the past uh, 50 or so videos we have. Um, if you've missed Mark Stigdor or Andy Pauline or Jim Calban, you can just catch up with what they had to share with us the past several years. Very quick uh, introduction on the uh, chat. Uh, obviously, you can actually go into the chat and talk to each other and engage with us, the moderators. But also, if you have a specific question for Eric, uh, make it clear to us that's actually a question for him. We're going to aggregate those over the next uh, 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to ask those questions for you as you are all muted and to not uh, uh, disrupt him. Uh, so make sure to actually in the chat, you are specific about this is a question for Eric, so we can capture that and kind of like uh, ask him at the end of the session. Um, let's, it's not moving for whatever reason. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Journey AI. Uh, it is obviously a new tool for service design prototyping. We're going to be talking about this and this only today. I was, I was going to go through that. Uh, obviously, it's a service design show, so I want to make sure now we're bringing the best uh, tools for you to do better service design. You can use it for other stuff, but this is definitely going to be our focus today is about service design prototyping. So obviously, the creative tools have evolved. You know, I don't want to go all the way back to the tablets, but we basically have been evolving our tools as creatives and designers. And today we have a new tool, right? It's called Journey AI. It didn't exist, you know, a few months ago, but now it is. And it looks like it's going to be here to stay with us, and we have to adapt our lives with it. Um, but we have to make the we have to make it a new tool, right? So we have to learn to use it and to use it right. Um, and there's been quite a lot of confusion on the in the marketplace about which tool to use for video, which tool to use for for pictures. And there's a lot of new tools out there, and Eric is going to walk us through that. Um, I'm having some trouble with my computer today, I'm not sure why. Okay, so let's talk about all different cases we've seen recently, right? So for example, Linus has been showing us uh, how you can very quickly and easily, if you just go and yes, for like, I want a, a bowl of cereal that has blueberries and raspberries, within seconds you have that, right? So he speeds things up. This has been done basically the same way with uh, food photographers. I have personal friends of mine who do food photography. They've been doing this for many years and they are extremely good at that. Um, there is going to be some question whether they are replacing it or not. We're not gonna get into the whole uh, copyright infringement because this is not really gonna be our call here today, but we can definitely speed things up with AI to just create those very easily, right? So this would take seconds to execute versus several days, maybe in this case a day, uh, through a food uh, photography studio, for example, right? So that's one example. You can also explore some really cool possibilities, right? If you actually go and say, I want to have some really cool uh, photo shoot about 1960s, uh, colorful, you can actually create those really nice things. Again, those can be executed currently through uh, regular fashion uh, photography, uh, fashion shoots. Um, those can be done right now, but obviously you can get those done very quickly, even for an ID in a matter of seconds or maybe a minute versus an entire day of a photo shoot. You can also have some fun, right? So we actually have seen some people like, what would it look like if Jesus would take a picture, a selfie at the Last Supper, right? So that can be interesting. It makes you wonder, it makes you wonder, it kind of makes you kind of like think for yourself, kind of, what would it look like, right? 
If you take it a bit further, you can also see, for example, that those was actually executed to show what would it look like to actually have conquistadors or Maori or Egyptian soldiers if they were taking a selfie. This is actually done uh, around like cognitive science to study the effect of smiling, for example, right? So again, this can be used to actually just kind of like look into what the smiling uh, has been evolving over the years. Again, very interesting. Those could have been done through an extensive photo shoot. This was done for a very few minutes by scientists. So a very useful tool for them as well. You can also do for fun, right? I can just get a very quick uh, you know, picture of myself looking very, uh, very snappy and very like 1950s. Um, those are kind of like fun stuff. You can actually just get your own headshots and it could be fun as well, right? You can also go crazy. You know, if you actually go into the AI, you can just type in, what would it look like for a goat and an eagle playing soccer in a mountain? And ta-da, here you have it, right? I'm not sure the value of that is, and I'm going to question the kind of conversation people are having to get to this point. But you can see that already very quickly, you have very different, uh, very big differences of output by just changing the prompt. Just one word would make a very different variation of prompts. So that's kind of survival. And that brings us to the next subject, right? So we've talked about, for example, what would the impossible look like? And now we talk about something like similar for our line of work, right? So what would it look like to actually create something that's be, it would be very difficult to recreate this. Like this cannot be photographed, those things don't exist. Um, and obviously our guest today, Eric, was able to do this, I think, three months ago. Um, and it was like one of the pioneer of, of this kind of uh, uh, art. Um, and that went viral. So he's going to talk a bit more about this in his presentation. But this was, I think, three or four months ago. And this was like unbelievable, as we had never seen this level of quality of prototyping of things that exist yet. So I'm going to talk very quickly about the prototyping part of service design, right? So uh, at Slalom, we're actually using a triple diamond. We, we may have used a double diamond, but usually we go through this very linear sequential way of doing work, which is discovery definition. And then usually we hit that, uh, uh, the wall of prototyping, right? A lot of people uh, did not go to art school, design school, advertising school, and a lot of strategists um, have a very difficult time going to that uh, prototyping uh, stage, which is kind of like making things come to life, even if it's for business, even if it's for budgeting, even if it's for like focus groups, there is kind of like this, okay, now we have to make it tangible, we have to make it real, right? So usually the prototyping looks like a wall. A lot of people hit that prototyping wall because they just don't know how to actually make those ideas they have to come into fruition, come to reality. And it is kind of like this, I don't know how to draw, right? I've heard that a thousand times. I don't really know how to prototype and how to draw and how to make things with my hands. But now guess what? We have a solution for you because anyone can actually prototype anything. So that's a really a game changer for a lot of people on this call. So, for example, just take an example. If your client is British Airways, for example, right? So you're going through the whole process. I'm making stuff over here, but you go through the discovery, and the insight is we have a decline in sales and satisfaction for first class flyers. Great. You move to the definition, which is we're trying to look for a more engaging experience for first class flyers. And then we hit the ideation stage, like how might we? And then somebody comes up with this great idea, which is how about we create a collaboration with Burberry to reimagine the British Airways first class experience. And then we have a prototyping stage. And usually it kind of looks like that, right? Somebody uh, is able to kind of like draw a very quick you know, sketch of what it would look like a first class in British Airways with a, a Burberry feel to it, right? And then the validation becomes very difficult because then you actually have to show it to people, you have to convince them. And it's kind of hard because they don't really understand what you're talking about. And usually it kind of looks like that, right? Somebody is going to be in a room, a focus room or, or business room is kind of like, okay, people, imagine a British Airways uh, airplane uh, completely you know, changed to look with a Burberry field. And people don't really understand what you're talking about. They have a really hard time projecting themselves into an airplane that looks like Burberry. There is a lot of confusion, right? What if instead you could show them that? Because like, okay, now let's talk about this. What if I show you this? Would you be willing to actually go into a first class in British Airways? Would you enjoy this? Would you like this? Now you have a very different kind of reaction from your focus groups or users or whatever you're trying to get out of them. So that's how we're trying to get to you. We're trying to bring your tools, going to allow you to go from that 
a prototyping into actually getting something that's very uh, memorable and tangible for people to relate to and resonate with them. It's like, yes, I can see myself in this seat. Yes, I can see myself in those headphones. Yes, I can see myself in this seat. Yes, I'm willing to pay X if you're doing a like pressing strategy, for example. So we're gonna talk about this today. How do you prototype for a service design uh, engagement? Today, we're gonna to have Eric. So Eric has been the creator of those examples. So we talked about Akia and Patagonia, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's been viral on, on LinkedIn and other places. He has also been the creator of this British Airway and Burberry. And he also has more recently done one with Jeep and the Northwest, which is also fantastic. So Eric is going to tell us today how he's done this and what his process is and what you should be doing and not doing and give you some tips. Um, and hopefully in the, in the next hour or so, you will be able to do the exact same kind of work up pretty close. You now, Eric is a really good creative guy. So, you know, I'm going to be as good as his stuff at first, but hopefully with practice, um, you will get there as well. So today we're going to be doing a hands-on uh, step-by-step tutorial. We're going to be able to uh, talk about the adaptability and iteration of initial prompts. You know, he's going to talk about how the prompt is very important and how just changing one word or two words make a huge difference. Um, he's going to tell you about how you have to retain create direction and vision. You're going to get a whole bunch of pictures that are just not going to be good. Just be ready for that. You're still going to have to use um, some some kind of creative understanding of what you're trying to achieve, right? You can't just get the first ones. It may take like 300 pictures to get the one you're looking for. Uh, he's going to talk about how you can use aesthetics and artistic sensibility to actually decipher that. Like, I don't like this. I like that. It's too heavy. It's too dark. It's too yellow, whatever. And they're also going to teach you how to curate and teach the result to machine learning, right? It is still a machine that is learning from you. So your input is still very important in order to actually tell, you know, mid-journey in this case, we can like make it better. Uh, it's not magic. So you're still going to have to tell the machine how to make it better and what you're looking for. Again, it is just a tool. It has limitations. We're going to talk about this in the next 45 minutes or so. Um, so please uh, help me welcome um, Eric, who has uh, been, is going to be talking maybe about the, the first showcase, which is British Airways and Burberry, as well as the Jeep and North Face. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for being here. Um, I'm really excited to present this work because I think that there's a lot of insights that we can all find very helpful from it. Let's dive right into it. I think we had a very nice setup from Greg. Um, I just want to go a little bit further because I think people want to know like exactly what my background is, like what brings me in as the expert. And I don't know if I'm an expert in AI, but I consider myself like an expert in advertising and doing global campaigns and working with clients to solve problems. And I think that relates a lot to this prototyping and service design field and consulting. Uh, I've worked with a lot of different international clients everything from Adidas to Apple to MasterCard, Nissan, a lot of work, Coca-Cola. And um, that has brought me into this world of understanding how to find solutions for the different challenges that, that either the client identifies or you help the client identify. And then having this back and forth, this conversation with the client to kind of reach that result. And I think that's a very important part that uh, we're going to see later on how that, that, is going to be challenging for AI to take over. I think there's always going to be that human aspect. And I have over 50 awards uh, doing this uh, internationally, the coveted Ken Lyons to Clio and effectiveness awards with Effies. And that's what's kind of gotten a lot of the, the attention of the work that I've done is kind of this background. And uh, normally my work looks like this, which is usually whether it's a TV commercial or a, or a campaign or a um, special digital project, and that's been done through my work with uh, large network agencies like Gray, where I was creative lead, TBWA, where I was creative director, and most recently McCann as uh, executive creative director. So that's kind of like what my work, you know, normally looks like and going and narrowing that focus down into a more uh, product focused is what I've done recently with generative AI. And that's where these three projects kind of got a lot of attention. Uh, we're talking about like four and a half million views with Patagonia and Ikea, a thousand reposts. Uh, I think this is why everyone is here today to take a look at behind the scenes, how does this work get created? I want to show you something that I haven't shared before because I have shared a lot of information on a lot of these different uh, projects, but I want to show you a lot of the fails, which will make you probably feel better in your process of searching for the right images because there is a lot of like failure uh, in a search. And I'll give you my 
best reasoning why I think it failed. And uh, I think we can talk about like what adjusts, I think week after week as the as these tools kind of improve themselves, what adjusts and what to look out for. So these projects are featured in Fast Company, Ad Age, Forbes. And I want to jump into the question because everyone keeps on asking me, you know, which one do you use? And there's a great answer to that that was that came from a YouTuber. His name is Matt Wolf. And I think a lot of the information that you can find as far as like learning, if you want more details, comes from YouTube. But this is a fantastic site. It's called futuretools.io. This is probably a very valuable thing just to get from this meeting today. It has 1,600 different AI apps. Some of them are free. Some of them are paid. Some of them are, you get the first three generations for free. And it has everything from chatting to text to doing coding to doing speech uh, to doing generative AI for images, what we're going to see today. But I think this is a really great way to have on hand all the tools and it has all the news that's being generated about AI. I think it's probably the most in-depth site right now that's not covered in advertising and articles uh, that's very just naked and to the core of what it is. If you ask me personally what I use, I mean, I'm really only using OpenAI's ChatGPT, Google Bard, because I think there's some places where Google Bard does a better job than ChatGPT. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the specifics of text today. There's some use cases where I'm going to show. Mostly I want to focus on image because I think that's where me and my design background and my art direction aesthetic background is going to be probably more valuable. Uh, I think that image, there's really mid journey, which is the main one. And the reason why I have listed here stable diffusions, uh, stability AI's stable diffusion is because it's such a technical program. If you really want to get deeper into it, and if you're looking for maybe like uh, an enterprise solution, I think that there's much deeper tools available with uh, stable diffusion. But if you are just skimming the surface, I think the model that you're going to get with MidJourney is much better. And what I want to show is the work that's been done that kind of compares, you know, the three main image generators on the market. There's Dolly, MidJourney, and Stable Diffusion. This was a comparison done by Wade McMaster, another YouTuber. And you see right down the middle, I mean, MidJourney is just on another level as far as creating atmosphere, um, having the stylization. And, you know, while you can't argue that maybe last year, if we were looking at these images from Stable Diffusion and Dolly, you would say, this is fantastic that out of nothing, zero, you can get these images. Today, it's a different reality. And that changes like week by week, month by month about what you should expect. And MidJourney has done a lot more to stay ahead of the curve in that situation. And just aesthetically, what it produces, I think is better. So I would guide everybody towards using MidJourney, whether that's paid or the freed options. I'm not sure if they still have the free options available. But that's really where I think you're going to see a lot more impact from your prompts. And I think you're going to be much more pleased with the work that comes out of it. So a lot, a lot of people are talking about the potential of AI and, and what does this mean and how it's going to revolutionize the, the market and how it's going to make all projects different. And I, I'm get kind of tired of the word, like the potential, because usually this means like so future and forward thinking like 10 years from now. And, uh, you know, when AI like first came out at the beginning of this year, like everybody was making images of like astronauts riding unicorns. And then, you know, weeks later, people were talking about how everyone's going to be unemployed in, uh, in the service design industry and in the advertising industry. And I thought that like, this is crazy. There's got to be some like practicality and some steps in between what's going on here. And I didn't want to look 10 years out or three years out. What, what's important for me right now is to focus on today and what we can do. And I think today, if you logged in to MidJourney and you had a task from a client and you needed to create a prototype for a self-tightening strap system for a harness and you actually briefed MidJourney for this, you know, what comes out, this is a real example that was done by D2M, what comes out, it, it, it looks very interesting. You know, there's no doubt about it. If you don't have design skills and this came from nothing, just from a text prompt up here, and it made these uh, these different objects, it looks interesting, but the practicality behind it might be limiting. And actually the comparison, the reason why D2M created this was because you know, their real product, which they created, looked more like that on the right-hand side. Uh, it has this more human design element uh, 
it has this more like ease of use. It's it's the design is more human. It's um, it has less moving parts. And when you compare that to what AI spit out, you know, for me, it relates back to this very generic phrase that was up at top. And I get what I want to pinpoint with you today in a presentation is the type of prompts that you need to choose and what's the work behind those prompts that you have to do to decide in your mind about what your vision is for the project. This is one more example from D2M. You know, they wrote uh, a compartmentalized backpack system for storing food. This is an actual brief, which they had from a client. And when you look at this, I mean, it doesn't look like it was done by mid journey. I think that this was done by like stable diffusion, but you can see that it's kind of like sloppy and, and, you know, it's not very realistic and the logic of why these different foods are separated, you know, and why is it in a box? Is it not in a box? It's not very good. And when you compare it to the actual product which they, which they designed, you can see it's a lot more practical and pragmatic in their approach where you have this little drawer that slides out and the food might be separated like that. What I could say is that if they would approach this differently, you know, internally, they could design, you know, with, their, with, with the logic and the team that they had to kind of discuss this, they could design this food storage system and then go in to mid journey and make maybe a little bit like more beautiful or aesthetically pleasing the external side of the bag, because I'm sure mid journey could do backpacks quite well. Um, it's just the fact when you try to leave all of the logic to the AI to decide for itself, which compartments should hold which food, it becomes a, uh, it becomes too many instructions wrapped up into one. And it's not very good at answering those types of questions very fast. So a question that I asked myself, which Greg kind of brought up as well, when you talk about food photography, was this AI versus photographers. And this was a question that I that I answered in a, in a YouTube video. I'm going to share it at the end. Uh, but it, it really got me asking this question when I made this North Face and Jeep uh, brand collaboration because the photographs or the images that were generated by Mid Journey that came out were so high resolution. Uh, they looked so realistic. It was it was hard to deny, you know, that this could be this could be a game changer. I mean, look, you can see though here that the you know the branding is is not it's not a hundred percent there, and it's still making problems with the uh, with the text. But that's that's okay. I think that as in the prototyping phase, we're just trying to see what we can do with this tool in order to capture the imaginations of maybe our, our test audience or our clients or even our creative team. So we can get everybody sort of marching forward in a singular direction rather than having so many random possibilities that are there. So, but this idea, Jeep in the North Face, this wasn't, I mean, the idea itself was not generated by AI. I mean, this came from, from a lot of thinking that I had and a lot of meditations on why would it be good for Jeep to collaborate with North Face? Uh, and then even in that collaboration, what would they actually make? And I had to define for myself what would be the result of that collaboration. And that's where I had to make this list of, it could be bags, it could be a keychain, it could be seat covers, it could be trunk liners, it could be extra interior pockets, or a rooftop cargo carrier. And then when I had this list of what I had defined for myself, what could be featured for this sort of brand collaboration, I then started to build prompts around those items that I had identified. So for the rooftop cargo carrier, I wrote out this prompt, black minimal geometric North Face branded hard shell carrier roof rack product shot on top of a black Jeep Wrangler. Now, what am I doing when I write out all these different words? I'm trying to create this gentle balance of not having too many words because every single word that you insert into the prompt dilutes the importance of other words that you have there. Um, but also trying to be as descriptive as possible to give cues to the AI where it's going to see, I want it to be geometric. I want it to be from North Face. I want it to be hard shell. I want it to be a roof rack. I want the realization of it to be on top of a black Jeep Wrangler. And the images that I got out from this sort of prompt, I mean, I'm just going to put them all on here. I go into much further detail on the YouTube of, uh, of this part of the process, but I got a lot of different images. And, you know, if you, if you don't really look at it with an art director's eye, you might say like, everything looks great. It looks beautiful. 
But when I looked closer and I started to say, maybe this one's a bit too big, you know, maybe I don't like the coloration in here because maybe the background's a little bit distracting. Like I can't see some of the details that are inside of this roof rack. And the ones that I liked the most were this one up here and also this one over here. And the reason why is because I just like this sort of uh, way that I could I could get the North Face logo up above where you could realize that this is like a, uh, a brand collaboration project. And over here, what I liked about this was that you had this sort of metal protection of a, of a cage around that sort of soft shell. And even though I briefed for hard shell, it kind of looks like it's a soft shell roof rack. And I thought that that looked very practical. And you can see from practicality how many other uses that kind of came up, which maybe are not as practical. And I think I should redefine that, what I mean by practical. Uh, also, when I make a comparison to like what's been done before, if I'm trying to break new ground with this sort of idea, you know, these look very average. Uh, they look like they've been done a million times. And once I look at this, that's where I say this could incorporate sort of like two different styles. And that's what I liked about it. So another prompt that I wrote, Jeep Wrangler 2022, I defined the model just to make sure that it wasn't doing an older model because sometimes the images that I was getting back, they were too old. It was like, like a dusty, you know, Jeep that had the, the, the back that was cut off. So I wanted to make sure it was modern, rear trunk cargo bed liner branded with the North Face logo, product shot, the North Face branding. I added in the North Face branding a second time. And the reason why was because sometimes the logos were not coming out. And what I got back from this one, I got a lot of different, you know, variety when it comes to these, these, uh, the rear trunk space. And I'm going to show you in a minute, but you know, some of these weird glitches that happen, you know, where the, the, the passenger seat is facing away, it's facing almost out the window. You can see the steering wheel way in the background here. And it's on the pass the passenger side door. It's kind of weird, you know, what's going on. So there's these strange hallucinations which happen. And these are like these little accidents. And you have to learn how to roll with the punches and continue to reprompt and kind of find this fluidness in your process where you don't get hung up on it and reprompt and go back. And you know, from the set of images, I really only liked one that I thought, you know, was doing a very good job of showing that there'd be this this liner in the back uh, of the trunk there. But when I look at the real photo of a Jeep, there's a roll bar, you know, the place where these, this fastening system is in the seat is not exactly the same location. I mean, it's pretty good that AI can recognize that, but the roll bar is missing, you know, and you look down here, this wheel is kind of like, there is no wheel at that point. There's a door that opens up and the wheel is attached to it, but it's not supposed to be down there. And when you look at the other wheel, you know, this should be in the wheel well, sort of, if you could see through with x-ray vision, it would be over here. But for some reason, it's like turned to the side. So there's these little glitches that are there. And what that means to me is that, you know, if you're trying to just give a quick snapshot of this is the product we're focusing on, and you might like blur out the background, if you really want to use this for a client presentation, there's a lot of precautions that you have to take. But if you're looking more internally to sort of prototype and guide the process, and maybe you want to send this to a manufacturer and you want to say, we need it to be, you know, this size, and this is what it needs to look like, that might be easy. But if you send it to the client and you say, it's going to be exactly like this, the client's going to have a lot of question about the product that they build. And I think that's what we have to really make sure that we, you know, the, the results might look like it's magic. Even when I see the, the, the cockpit view and you see this, these extra pockets that I generated that are attached to the seatbelt here. That's the focus of my image, this new product. But if you look deeper into the background, which is not the focus, you have these problems where the window is separated from the door frame. The steering wheel itself is a little bit, you know, warped. It's kind of falling over. And this is in the newest version. This is in the newest version of, of mid journey. And it's still making these, these problems. The door handle is not in the right spot because the door handle is never right where you where your chest is, it's further out. So you can naturally reach out and open the door uh, from over there. So you can see little things like the center console off. I'm showing you this so that you can realize that the images that you get, that you get back, if you're trying to base it 100% on reality, there's going to be some things that are off. 
there's some objects that it does better than others. And the way that you're going to get there is really by experimentation. But I could say that, you know, if I really needed to, I could then go in with a CAD model. If I, if I really had Jeep as a client, I could have a CAD model and I could change out the background and I could just put these pockets on in front of it. And then I could actually give it to a 3D designer and have a 3D designer sort of model around these pockets, uh, uh, a 3D object and actually create a CAD model about, about those, uh, those pockets that I could then deliver to a, a studio that would start manufacturing it as well. The next prompt, beautiful product photography, the North Face times Jeep Wrangler 2022 collaboration, black Jeep, black nylon accessories. What it gave back, I wanted this sort of like cool imagery that would supplement the objects that I was making. And this was the, the hero of this sequence that came up. And as you can see, I mean, the detail that you get in there is beautiful. But what you see in the background, you know, this should say Rubicon, but it doesn't say Rubicon. It's kind of like glitched out in the background. And you can kind of see that there's like one Jeep, which is parked this way, maybe another Jeep with the window. It, it's, a, it's a bit weird. And the AI is not paying attention to the geometry of the actual Jeep in the background because the focus is the person in the foreground. And whether or not this is a great new product, I mean, I can't tell if this is a this is supposed to be a new backpack or a new jacket or a new hat. What I just liked about it was the demonstration of the photographic quality and kind of this atmosphere of if you would create a product line where it combines two brands, what's the kind of look and feel and mood that you would get out of it? And I think that's where AI gave me a, a jump forward in that case. So from all of these different images, that I had generated, this is just a small selection, but I really only generated a few. And that leaves us with like 12 generated images from doing 100 generated images. So I only selected from those 112. And that took me an entire day to do. It was like when, from, when I went from morning to like late at night to get there. I want to talk about another project, uh, which I think has a lot of parallels. So when I did the Patagonia and Ikea project, it was the first project that I did. It was like January and it got so much hype. I think it was easy to do that project because Ikea has so many different types of styles when it comes to their furniture. There's not so much consistency there. And I wanted to do something that was more like exclusive with high consistency because this is one of the big challenges when it comes to AI is how can I make sure that the objects that I'm creating have a consistent color code or pattern or style. And that's why I came up with this British Airways and Burberry idea. Uh, in addition to some of the challenges that British Airways was facing at the time, some of the rebranding that Burberry was going on, these are both like very hot topics. But I asked myself, you know, what would that actually look like as an interior? And that's when I got these images that we saw a little preview of before uh, in higher resolution here. But I want to show you I think what's much more interesting, the fails that happen here, because it takes you a while to find that groove. And I failed a lot. And uh, I want to show you what some of those fails were. I don't know why I see a little, I see a little uh, drawing here on the corner. Let me just make sure. Yeah, I can the show that. In Zoom. <laughs> Antonio, what did you do? I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to come back in. Just... Please, everybody, stop drawing on his presentation. Stop <laughs> drawing on. <laughs> uh, okay, can you see the screen again? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we're all good. We're just all muted. Okay, great. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna put the. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna hide this floating meeting controls. Great. Back in action. So this idea of of. Uh, Burberry in British Airways, it was sitting in my mind for a while. And I actually didn't launch it because the first time I had spent like two days and, and created really bad images. And it just something was not right with my prompts. Uh, here's here's one example. So the, the, the fail was the actual prompt was a first class British Airways seat made of material with the iconic Burberry pattern, British Airways and Burberry branding, airplane interior. And it, it seems like logical as a prompt, what I got back was, was pretty, I don't know, expected as a design, I think, but it put wine glasses directly on the seat, which is like when you're doing 
something that's that's high luxury, you have to think of etiquette and the codes of etiquette. And it's not a good idea to put a wine glass like on a chair if you're going to do product photography. It looks like a used napkin is next to it. And when I look up above, this isn't a British Airways logo. It's not a Burberry logo. It's just like some extra thing that was on there. And it kind of got me to ask the question, like, how does it compare to a real British Airways first class seat? And I didn't think we were moving the needle as far as revolutionizing first class or British Airways. Because, I mean, it, to the untrained eye, it looks very similar. And that's when I said, okay, I've got to go back to do something different. I'm going to show you a couple more fails. I wrote something different. A first class airplane interior with designs from Burberry fashion. And fashion was a separated word from here. And what came back, it, it kind of like went to this weird, you know, world of pastels and like peach colored and you know this these tans that were in there and the designs were over designed and i think that it came from the keyword fashion that kind of was that that wrench in the gears that just threw us into the wrong trajectory and that's what you have to do when you see images that look like this is take a look back at your prompt and try to dis discover what actually made the problem and 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 think how does a machine interpret the words that you're using You'll see that I didn't use British Airways in this prompt. And the reason why was because the previous image where you saw that the British Airways chair looked very standard. It looked like the expected traditional British Airways first class seat, which is, it's not something new. It's not going to make headlines. It's not going to get you PR. Uh, and that's why I left out British Airways, because what I understood is when I used British Airways first class as a prompt, or I used that wording inside of my prompt, it gave the signal to Midjourney to think of its library of all of the different British Airways first class interiors and to sample that as a reference. And I didn't want to do that because what I was trying to do is revolutionize. I was trying to change the interior of uh, British Airways first class. So I understood that it was giving too many cues to, to mid-journey to use that design style of an existing British Airways chair system. And that's why I ended up just saying first class airplane interior. This is another fail. Accessories for first class passengers with the iconic Burberry textile pattern, product photography. And you know, I mean, it probably sounds very harsh to say it's a fail because it's still pretty amazing that AI is generating this. But when I look closer, I don't know if this is a pillow or if it's a bag. It seems to have this belt system to fasten it and to open it up. The headphones are kind of cool. And that kind of gave me a cue that I should be doing headphones. That would be a really good idea. But together in this whole layout, in this image, I didn't really like what was happening above as well. I, I didn't think that it was, it, was, it was not so specific as an object. I didn't know if it was a purse or a pillow. And that didn't make me very confident. Here's another one, a male model wearing a Burberry design sleeping mask. It looks like Batman. <laughs> it looks like a superhero. Uh, and it's, it's fused into his face in some places, which is you're, you're going to find that some of your prompts, it might be, you know, it's weird, but sometimes the AI has a bad day uh, or with some wording, it has a, you know, just a bad trajectory with it. And I found a big challenge, you know, uh, with, with, with rendering a sleeping mask on the face of a person for some reason. I wrote also sleeping comfortably and peacefully on a first class airline sleep, uh, seat. The reason why I kind of wrote out so much description was because AI will interpret based off its image data set. And some of those might be stock photos, you know, where it has somebody like snoring with their mouth open. Uh, it might, it might not be very comfortable when you think about the, uh, the, the stereotype of what it's like to sleep in an airplane. So I tried to make sure that there was, you know, to articulate within that wording that it's going to be comfortable and peaceful, but it threw off the images and, entirely. And I'm going to show you some worse ones here. Maybe I'm, maybe you feel like I'm being too harsh with the system, but if you're going to use these images as something to show to the client afterwards, the client's going to scrutinize in, in a much more specific detail than I am right now. So this was, you know, one object I wanted to have Burberry branded slippers. And separately, a sleeping mask neatly set on a first class airline seat. And what happened here, I mean, I guess these, I guess that's a slipper, which is kind of like fused together. And then it looks like swimming goggles 
<laughs> that are on top of the slippers. And uh, it couldn't separate these two objects very well. When I wrote them and it, because so many people have been going into mid journey and saying a fusion of this and a fusion of that, I think that it's been training the AI to kind of fuse things that you want and trying to put them together. So you, you have to approach prompting a little bit differently when you want separate objects inside of there. This was a fail for me because I thought that this prompt for a ticketing system, I, I thought that it came out very traditional. It looked kind of like old school. It looked like it was made in the 1950s. And I tried to write in here, you know, modern Burberry designed airline ticket, but it didn't re reflect something that I thought looked very modern. And if I'm trying to curate a design code of what it means to be at the cutting edge of luxury, I, as an art director, when I look at these images, need to need to reject some images or maybe even reject some products, which I'm not having a good time creating. So in this case, I, I think I gave like five different prompts for this. And at one point I got tired of waiting and I just said, okay, I'm going to do away with the ticketing system because the tickets are not looking very interesting and I'm, I'm, it's going to throw off my flow when it comes to creating this project. You know, and at one point I started to get more into the, the models that I wanted to see that were enjoying this sort of this new luxurious first class, uh, uh, recreated first class of Burberry in British Airways. And maybe at a distance, this might look good, but like when you start to, to pay attention closer, it looks like, like a keyboard, which is embedded into the window. And normally in, in first class, you're not, you know, forced to look directly out the window. Normally in first class, you're, you're looking forward and the window is on your right or your left-hand side. And there's not much leg room here. I don't know if he's playing with an iPad. There's a couple of problems here with the fingers. It's kind of like in different directions. And I don't see the design code of Burberry in here. So for some reason, it's made a misinterpretation. And I thought that I could just, you know, I was giving it a test. I wrote that it should be an advertisement. And I tried to put some text inside of there. That's body copy down below. Um, and it might be an interesting spot to put, you know, uh, a bit of text, but it's so far off as far as the image. And even he might look a little bit cross-eyed. I can't tell where he's looking that I decided this is not the image. And then where I had a lot of challenges was when I briefed Midjourney to do more than one model. Excuse me. Uh, at one point I did, I wrote, a Burberry photo shoot of models relaxing in an airplane first class. I wanted to see this sort of like vibe, this sort of mood, this lifestyle of relaxing in luxury. And I threw it this challenge, but the image that I got, it looks like she's a corpse <laughs> lying down. Uh, there's a lot of different limbs that are coming out from there, which is, which is a bit bizarre. It looks like a bad dream, you know, uh, it looks a bit like a nightmare. You know, you have this melting face, you have these hands that the fingers look like feathers or something. And uh, I understood that this was like a bad day for mid journey and it wasn't going well. And there was going to be some images that I just had to forget and move on and to start prompting in a different way. So the prompts that got me the right images, I'm going to show you right now. And I haven't shared these prompts anywhere else. So this is kind of exclusive to this meeting today. The first one, and I want to, I want to point out to you how concise and short it is. Burberry branded luggage tag, and what came back was very simple, very elegant. I didn't write here that it was product photography. I didn't write that it should be beautiful. I just wrote Burberry British, uh, sorry, Burberry branded luggage tag. It's kind of like a, a tongue twister there. And I generated another one. I didn't like exactly it, but I wanted to see what my options were. And then finally, I got this one, which I thought was the best. And that was the one that I decided to upscale. Maybe there's some problems with the text, but I could imagine that this, even I could probably be confident enough to show it to the client and say, you know, there's some problems with our stitching here. But when we, when we get the right wording on there, it could, be, it could be a great souvenir to give out to people that would ride in this new first class redesigned by Burberry. The next one, Burberry branded sleeping mask, neatly set on a first class airline seat. Again, you'll notice that I omitted British Airways because I was trying to revolutionize what British Airways first class looked like. And what came back 
where these images where I would say there's a lot of problems inside of them. And that's where you can remix, you know, what you, what you get. And that's, I looked at this and I said, it looked too cheap. You know, this one looks like the pillow is actually a person's face and uh, it looks kind of cartoony. I don't know what this is here. Maybe it's like a neck pillow. And this one, I, I liked more or less the coloration and the, the, the direction that it was going in. But this is a, you know, if I had a team of designers, I don't think I would receive this type of mistake, you know, where it looks like it's kind of sunglasses. So what I did was I selected this image and I said that I want to, I want to make uh, variations based on this image. And what Mid Journey did is it came back and made one with a little bit more texture that was on there, looked like a visor. You know, this one looks a little bit more soft. This one has some extra leather things that are sewn into it. And I liked this one the most because it just sort of seemed like this nice panel. It represented enough the very traditional classical sleeping mask that you would have. But it had some nice, you know, premium elements that were inside of it. But I didn't know what this was up above. It was like a hat or a piece of cloth. And I don't think Midjourney knew what it was either. It's just interpreting, you know, from a blurry image and diffusing this image to realize what we're seeing here. And that's when I came back and I said, okay, let's do more variation based on that. And I like this image the most. And when I selected this image, I clicked on upscale. And I want to show you, you know, the difference between you know, this was what was generated the first round. And when I upscaled it, it looked very different than the image that I had created. Uh, there were some new added details. And that's something you can expect when you upscale some of the images in Midjourney. And it was a happy mistake. You know, uh, it's a fluke, but I love the way that the, the material that's in the pillow here looks a bit more premium than the fuzziness of what's going on over here. I love that somehow it created this trim. It created this trim around the, the visor and it, it looks like it's something that would protect the light from exposing uh, your eyes. And I liked what I had here. Another winning prompt Burberry branded business class airplane interior. So before I focus on the winner, which was this one, you know, take a look at some of the other challenges that we're looking at here. I don't know where your legs go in this one. It looks like there's a screen here for you to look at, but there's not a, a back of a chair to support your back when you look at that. So there's not a lot of logic which is going into the AI. It's really making decisions, especially in mid-journey, more based on aesthetics. Uh, I don't know what this is. It's kind of like blocking the view. And I don't know if this is like a cockpit or something like that. And you know, here is probably more closer to something traditional, but I also don't see, It's I don't know where your feet go if they always have to be in the laying down position. Um, and it looks a little bit expected as far as the external side of it. And that's why I chose this one. So I decided let's make some variation based off of this. I didn't like some of the patterns. I didn't know how it would look when I would finally uh, upscale it. So I, I decided to go with some variation here. And I got a couple of different types of styles. It looks like a glitch as if this is like a 3D object. So I decided to forego that one. And that's when I focused on this one because... I thought that the pillow looked cool as far as the design went. Uh, I liked that as far as the chair being divided, it looks less divided in this image. And uh, I decided to upscale it. And that's where I want to share with you again, the changes that happened when I upscaled it. Actually, when I upscaled it, I flipped the image. And I, I flipped the image because when you look at this and you're trying to communicate, you know, into this this level of feeling when somebody sees this image, they should naturally assume that this would be comfortable to sit in. I have the feeling that this is like with your back facing the cockpit. And I want it to be the other way around where your, your face should be facing the cockpit, the front of the aircraft. And that's why I just did a, a quick flip on it. But what came out of the image was also it kept and retained the single glass that was there. But it used this little glitch and it, it reinterpreted that little glitch as two glasses on the window, which I thought was kind of weird, um, but it was okay. It was good enough. And I kind of like packaged that and I, I let it go on. I want to show you just lastly, a couple of the final prompts, which kind of sealed the deal for me. British Airways and Burberry redesigned the first class experience. 
when I teach people how to do prompts, this is one of the ways that I explain it is that if you think of your idea as a headline, you know, a headline is a very re reduced amount of words. Uh, and it really just includes the most important elements to describe what, what happened. And that sort of headline, if it was going to be in a newspaper or a journal, might be the best way sometimes uh, to get the image that you want. And that created a really nice mood for me. I like that image. Burberry branded accessories and stationery. You know, from a distance, it looks it looks cool. It was a nice complimentary image to add into the mix. But if I really look detailed into what's going on here, uh, I don't know what these are. They look like these little, it looks like a Q-tip or like little paint brushes. And I, I don't know, maybe it's a makeup kit. I'm not sure what it is. And, um, you know, when I look underneath and the, the stationery is there, I don't know if these are, are chopsticks. I don't know if it, it used to be maybe in the process, it was the cap to this pen and it was left over here, but at some point it became elongated when it was rendering and diffusing the image to kind of create what was there. And these are some of the challenges that were, that were happening with those types of images. But I decided it was good enough to kind of keep in the mix. And then this was like, you know, again, a very separate idea. I made a list of so many different objects that I wanted to see. And then I, I created those objects separately rather than trying to insert into this image, you know, this lady eating dinner. I created those separately so that in the viewer's mind's eye, you kind of connect all these objects together. And what I think about when I'm trying to create um, a series of images that would ex explain an idea, I, I think about, you know, how would a director if who's shooting a film approach the same sort of uh, material? And a director doesn't rely only on, you know, medium shots or long, long view shots or wide frame shots where you can get all the information. A director will sometimes hone in on little details, whether it's the zipper, whether it's uh, some of the fabric or the material is there. And that's what I'm trying to do is, is give space for the AI to focus on some of the separate objects that I'm interested in having, rather than trying to get all the objects all at once in one image, which will take forever. So I ended up getting nine selected images, which were the ones that I posted on, on LinkedIn and Instagram and ended up getting republished everywhere but it was from 200 images which i made that selection from uh i generated in total these 200 images and it took me two days to do that so what i want to really double down on is the fact that there's so much intervention to make this and so when people tell me you know they look at these ideas and they go oh that's fantastic you know ai did all of this and and i have to stop them uh and say that this is not automation entirely and that's where I want to focus again on what is happening today. Today, successful AI projects are guided and cherry-picked with many hours of human involvement. And I can guarantee you, if you're seeing anything online where it's a new project from AI goes viral, you're, you're looking at the final product, which was so like procured, and there were so many revisions and edits that were made until you got to that, where AI was assisting the person that wasn't taking over the project entirely. There's not, there's no magic button where you can just click generate, you know, a new idea that's going to be incredible and get this amazing originality from AI. You as the individual have to decide that for yourself. So where we are uh, is really right now, we're at the AI assisted stage of the innovation curve. You know, maybe later on, it might be this magic tool which decides things for you. Uh, I think that AI is doing some great things as far as maybe looking at quantitative data and digesting, you know, a large data set. It might give you some advice on something, but you as the individual have to make the decision based on what you think is right uh, in, in the end. And you can choose to accept what the AI gives you, or you can, you can choose to reject it. So if, in my opinion, creativity is still very human, and I don't think this is going to change very fast. And, you know, Greg showed this, this process, uh, which was these, these diamonds that he uses. I think of, you know, my agency process, which is I, I have triangles. Uh, and usually in the process of creation, I, I start with defining the idea, you know, what is the brief internally that we have the team work on? And what are the, the deliverables that we need to have for this idea? You know, so if I'm 
if I'm if I'm going to do something with Burberry, like what are the different products that we should create? And and it might be something from some strategic point of view, what what costs less to do, and it might be left open for the creative team to kind of dive in and, and make some of those uh, decisions for themselves. Uh, then you have exploring these expressions, and those are so many different sketches and reference images and mood boards about how that might come alive that you kind of expand and expand in, in the several days that you have, you expand across a wall. And then you, at one point, start to curate and redefine what it is that you want. And that's where you remove images that might be clutter. You remove what might be noise, what's maybe distracting to the core essence of the idea. And that takes a lot of high-level thinking. Uh, and whether that's a team decision or it comes from an executive creative director or a top level director inside of the the agency to decide that there's still a, a required human element to make that call. And then when you want to go present it, whether it's to your client or to the public or to for PR to a journal, you're going to have to package it and you need to package it in a beautiful way so that the public will understand the concept that you have. So this is like the normal process of creation that we have. And this is where I think AI fits in. Because a lot of people have been asking me, what does that mean for advertising? And what does that mean for innovations or creating new concepts for a brand? Doesn't that mean that you can just fire designers or art directors and let the AI take over? And I don't think that that's a replacement yet. I think that it's a parallel process right now. Today, definitely, it's a parallel process, and I don't think that it should replace anything else that's going on. So when I define the idea, I'm going to validate it with AI. You know, here's an example. I would go to ChatGPT, and I would say, if Burberry and British Airways made a brand collaboration to redesign first class, what are some products and accessories they could create for the brand collaboration? List 30. And then I would send that to ChatGPT, and it would come back with this list. It says uh, um, amenity kits for toiletries. It says cashmere blankets, um, monogrammed leather passport holders. It has everything from like uh, coasters for your drink, slippers. And that's a great list where I don't have to sit and think too much for myself. I could look at that and say, and cherry pick which ideas I think are right. I could also, from that list, like in a conversation that a normal creative couple would have, whether it's an art director with a copywriter, I could have this playback where I see that might be a great idea, and I will, I will, uh, I will use that idea. Or I might say that is not a great idea, but it inspires me to counter with a different idea, which might be uh, it might be the the headphones, for example. Maybe the headphones were a great idea that that. ChatGPT didn't come up with originally. So that's where I think that validating with AI is a great, great way to just check your work, to check your thinking, to kind of see like if AI would approach it, what would they do? Uh, and I think that's a very useful tool to have in your toolkit. And I think that also when you go to your expressions, you know, explore with AI. That's what we've really shown today. I think another way is, you know, if you have a, a product sketch, and maybe it's taken you hours to kind of come up with this and to isolate this idea. You can do this image to image where you feed this image into mid journey. You're going to have to write a prompt, you know, to describe what this image is. It's this concept sketch, detailed orthographic gaming mouse, silver and orange. And what comes back is it, you know, this is really interesting. It doesn't show the exact architecture or design of what this designer had fed into mid journey, but it does give some new ideas. So if you're stuck in a spot, you can feed an image into mid journey and you could see, you know, it might be a cool idea to hollow out the uh, inside of that mouse. It might make it lighter, or it might be an additional button that I want to have inside of there. You know, maybe there's something for ergonomics that could be there. But what I can say is you got to be careful because a lot of the images that Midjourney is spitting back uh, when it comes to that sort of quality is based off of you know an average of what are what are real and already existing devices in the world, and I think that this is a lot more original what the artist created. 
So when it comes to uh, packaging for presenting and you want to enhance it with AI, I think there's another use case, which is really good. So this is an image that was created in Midjourney, And this is a small boutique brand uh, that the that the creative director was trying to, to advertise. It's these CBD gummies. So they actually, when they created this image in Midjourney, went in and then photoshopped this image. They actually, you know, they 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 prompted for all these berries in the background. They got that image that we showed on the left-hand side. And then what they did was they took the actual container for the gummies and they photographed it in a more or less the right angle so they could get the shadows and the shading that kind of matched up. And then they photoshopped it and kind of mashed it all together and mixed it up so that they had this beautiful background to present their product so it would look a lot more desirable and appetizing rather than just having this you know sterile white bottle there so that looks a lot more flavorful to us and that's where i think that ai sort of fits into this process of creation as a parallel additional system instead of replacing something that you are already doing so which processes do I think are like future-proofed or, or which processes are future-proof or more safe? I think if you have any process that's going to be this back and forth with the agency and the client to redefine what the client needs or their agency to present something and the client gives some feedback about adjusting something, I think that there's this collaboration that happens in between a client and agency that AI cannot replace. And a lot of times I call it in my industry, you know, you're, you're like a, a psychiatrist for the client to help them decide between so many different stakeholders, whether it's the marketing director or the, the head of the brand or even the, the general director of the company, they might have different visions and you need to go back and help them explore what those visions are so that you can, you can get to the final result. And it's really difficult for AI to do that. And it's very difficult often for these companies to sit in the driver's seat and to do everything with their own hands. This is why they're hiring an agency. That's why when you go to a, a coffee shop, you ask a barista you know, to make your coffee for you. You could do it yourself, but you, you're, you're paying for the service of someone else to do it. I also think that highly original thinking, if you're trying to do something that hasn't been done before, uh, you're in a very safe spot because if you're doing something that's more standard or cliched, AI is great for just generating thousands of those types of results. But the moment that you come up with that new, if it's a fusion idea or it's a new way of thinking, AI is not going to make that idea itself. You know, you're either going to have to prompt for it. The origin of it is going to be inside of your head and you're going to have to prompt for it. AI is not really going to spit it out. And you're going to see that a lot of things that even come back from chat GPT when it gives you advice on what to create they're kind of standard. They're kind of expected. They're a little bit cliche. And it's not possible to go back to, cat, to chat GPT. It's not possible to go back and just say, you know, be more original or do something less cliche because it doesn't understand those. It's already giving you, you know, ideas that are sourced from its large data set. And because it's a large data set, it's already going to be, you know, this average of all these different ideas that are there. And then taste and curation, the human aspect of looking and deciding what stays and what is discarded, I think is very important. You know, when I did work with Apple internally, they always said for, for every yes, there's a thousand no's. And I think that that's, uh, it definitely relates to what we're doing in any of these processes here when AI is involved. You're going to have to say no many times and discard the things that you think that do not work. So today, this is how I'm going to wrap up. AI is more of an accelerator to your process. It's not a replacer. And I hope that answers a lot of questions around my process, around the way that I think the right way to prompt AI and to leverage AI in your process is. And uh, if you want more information on my prompts and process, I have, I have two videos that are on YouTube that go really deep into the Jeep and North Face brand collaboration and show even more of the fails that happened. And because there's been so much demand from the IKEA and the 
because there's been so much demand from the IKEA and Patagonia project, I've made a very in-depth video that talks about the entire process and which which images failed and why they failed and which products I decided to highlight and why I decided to highlight them. You can find that all on my YouTube. And here's my links when you want to see more of those types of content and more information on the projects that I've been doing. Okay. So I'm going to wrap it up here, guys. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, because you're in Hawaii, I'm interested in that one, you have time because it's very early for you. And two, you have to go to the beach very quickly. So <laughs> can we abuse your time? Because we have a ton of questions. Can we ask you a few questions? Absolutely. I'm here for you. And uh, I only went 53 minutes and I, I kind of blocked off the hour. So I have like about 15 minutes if we want to do so, that. Um, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, am I? No, no, you're fine. Um, okay. Robin, do you have the first question, please? Yep. Uh, and we, as Brandon said, we've been going through the questions. I know some of them have been answered through the presentation, but I don't think we got to this one. Uh, does prompt writing work similarly to search engine hacks, such as using a symbol like colon or dash on Google to search specific intent or specify the intent? Sorry. Yeah. So it depends on the, the AI tool that you're using. When it comes to mid journey, there is a whole instruction manual. It's like, I forget how many, you know, 50 pages, something like that. And you can read through the manual if you really want to get into those details. You can go on YouTube and, and do a, a search for like prompt structure. There's so many different theories about how to do it. What I found works for me the easiest is trying to use more natural language. Uh, what you can do if you're trying to, if you get an image back, let's say you're trying to fuse two things, and you get an image back where one of those objects, and one of the, an idea I tried to do is I wanted to do a Sony camera case that was actually uh, with a protection from like North Face. And that was one of the original ideas that I had. And it came back so bad because North Face was taking over and the camera wasn't really there. And so what I did was I, I started to add in these codes where you can say that you can add more weight there's a code that you can type in. You can add more weight to different words. And I forget exactly what it is because if I tell you, it, it, it might be off. And I suggest that you just do the, the, the search for it. But it's something along the lines of writing a, you know, a 10 or a 100 next to the weight of the word that you want. And then you can reduce the weight of the second word because maybe AI is paying too much attention to one of the words that's inside of there. And likewise, sometimes you'll get an image that comes back and you might say, it's a cool direction but something is not going well. And you can choose for more variation on one of those images and then start to ask it to correct it. But I can tell you in my experience, like in a lot of the back and forth that you'll have in the AI, it will sometimes degrade the image. And that's really how I got those nightmare images of like all the models with the fingers that were out of control and, you know, they're, it looks like a corpse that's laying down was because I, I tried to give it too many different commands. And uh, there's a lot of keyword stuffing that people are trying to do when it comes to their prompts. But, you know, I remember at the beginning of this year, people were writing in like, it must have 4K. It should say that it's it done an Unreal Engine. It must say that it's a uh, super high resolution. And I, I didn't see that the quality that was coming back from that was making it much better. I felt like it was wasting my time to type all that stuff out. You're going to have to experiment with it. And what I can say today, it might be, you know, different next week. And I think for some people might have like an emotional breakdown when you, when you look at the tools and, and how fast they update, by the time you think you've nailed something down, it's already, you know, magnitudes easier to do the next week. And uh, all I can do, all I can say is, if you're in the creative process, the more that you experiment with this is the more that you're going to feel comfortable with one tool or the other. Yeah. And to that point, I mean, uh, Eric, you've actually used Midjourney 4, I believe, for IKEA. And you used Midjourney 5 for Jeep. And there was already some huge differences, right? Yeah. And you also add some like camera angle, right? Like bird eye or portrait or whatever. And it makes a huge difference in the output as well if you're trying to get like a portrait. Yeah. So even, even when you type in a prompt, you can add in, you know, afterwards, maybe you like something you say, I'd like to see from the left hand view, or I want to see from the passenger view. You can, you can add in those words. Sometimes it'll work. Sometimes it'll not be so good, but it just, it's a, 
I think just like a director speaks to a storyboard artist, you have to think in those more cinematic terms because that's how you're going to articulate the image and what you want to see. That being said, it's really okay to come in if you don't really have a vision about what angle it's going to be at. It's really okay to come in and just sort of like try to narrow it down to what are the core elements you want to see in the image. You know, right now there's version 5.1 with Mid Journey. And if you type in a dog, it comes back with some really beautiful images that don't look like photography. They look very stylized. They look like they have this sort of like neon backgrounds. So uh, Mid Journey has been going in this trajectory of being a lot more stylized now. And uh, you don't need to give it much instruction to get it. Cool. Um, Brandon, do you have a question, I believe, around how can you actually give Midjourney a picture to work with? Oh, yeah. Uh, so that was one question. How often do you use image prompts when you're generating your stuff to kind of guide either a framework or a setting or an angle? Or do you do strict primarily, uh, sorry, do you restrict your prompts primarily to text? So uh, there is a project that I've done recently. I'm not going to tell it now because it's kind of like in development but i i did upload a library of images to mid journey to get it familiar with a brand that it didn't know before and it didn't seem to help the it didn't really seem to help and i i can tell you that it's a feature that mid journey says that it does uh and it w seems to work well when you're dealing with faces if you upload people's faces and then say, I want it to be done in a different style. I think Greg did this very well with his own face. He asked for, you know, this, this, you know, top hat looking like a, a gentleman and uh, that works. But when it comes to more abstract geometric objects, it seems to have some issues with that. It seems to read from the images that you upload less the, the content when it comes to the objects, but more of the style that you're uploading. And it uses that reference of color code and style as a way to dictate what the outcome is going to be. When it comes, if, if that's really an important factor, is the ability to upload an image and then to edit it through AI, Midjourney is not the best tool for that. And there's, there's Dolly where you can highlight some things that you want to adjust or, or change. Um, the reason why Stable Diffusion, I put it in that deck, is because there's, it's so deep, you can get lost going into Stable Diffusion there's so many ways to even use Stable Diffusion. You can use it online. You can download it locally onto your computer. And if you have a good graphics card and a lot of RAM, you can do it on your computer and you can modify and manipulate the code in Stable Diffusion to create a model of it that doesn't exist anywhere else. And then you can add you know, extra plugins on top of that so that you can start to sketch in, in Stable Diffusion and it will turn that sketch into something else. The issue for me coming from a design and art direction background is that the images that come out of stable diffusion just on a purely aesthetic view, I don't think look as good as the images that come out of mid journey. And that's why I focus more on mid journey when it comes to, you know, if I had, if I was building something for an enterprise or for an agency, and I said, we need to have a lot more control over what we're doing and we need to bring more standardization to this process then I might focus more on, on installing a server with Stable Diffusion on there and starting to experiment more with these different control nodes that you can put inside of there. But I think as we're really scratching the surface and what I'm explaining to you right now, it might take thousands of hours of, of individual work to build and to get up and running. Whereas in a month, a new product might come out on the market where it costs only $15 a month you know, to have a subscription to it. Um, one of the things I just saw today was, and this is also the problem with AI news. One of the things that I saw today, there's so much noise that's going on and you don't know what's a real tool and what's in development and when you can expect it to be released. I just saw, you know, this morning, there's a new tool that's been done by, I think it's in Berkeley. Uh, it's a, it's a, the, the researchers have built a product where you can actually dictate to the AI, take this photograph of a person now move their head over you know, this many pixels and then it does it, open their mouth and then it regenerates it. And it does it frame by frame, like gradually. And you can choose one of the in-betweens if you want to. 
and maybe it doesn't sound very amazing because we've seen so many things with with um, 3D objects and the way that they can be manipulated. But the fact that it does it from a static image without needing to cut out that image or to to identify where's the head and where's the arm, it's, it's pretty mind-blowing what it can do. But it can right now only do it for a set of images that the research group has inputted specifically into the system. And if you go and you try to upload your own images, I don't know if that's possible right now, and it's not available to the public right now. So there's there's these limiting factors that are always there, and that's why I, I think that I'm going to give a lot of these long-winded answers because there's so many different uh, so many different options to 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 interpret when you're trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. Again, experimenting and figuring out what is right for for you and your needs is going to be the easiest way. So, Eric, we've talked a lot about uh, photorealism, right? We're trying to we're trying mm -hmm. to how far can it go? How good can it be? How good for everybody? Now, let's talk about the opposite. Sometimes in our world, we actually don't want to show clients a final project. We can't really do it. We actually want something very sketchy, very like temporary, because we're trying to get people to not get completely like enamored with it, right? So, have you tried to do some like sketch? pencil that are by design kind of supposed to be like low fidelity and how is this working out for you? I haven't done it myself. I showed an example today of, um, of a product designer that inputted their own images and their sketches and they were able to, you know, one of the things that I've seen people do is they type in, uh, I want to see a, a blue line sketch of this object as if it's a, a product design process. And you can see all those different variations uh, come into play. I think if you're in the industry, it's a great way for you to maybe not to show the client immediately, but to consider as a team, which design elements do you want to extract from that? What I can say is that a lot of people in, in the industry, you know, usually you hire a designer. And the reason you hire a designer is because of the illustration ability. And often you can overcome a lot of those problems just by, by working with somebody who has the talent to sketch that. Because when it comes to that sketchiness, which is a great way to articulate an idea without the client asking too many questions, but why that color, why that material there? You're more talking about just the overall uh, structure of the object and the, the functionality of it. Uh, when you're on that level, I think that it's, it's, it's easier to kind of sketch it yourself. And that's, for me, it's easier to sketch it myself probably because of my, my, my history of doing illustration and design. So I haven't done much of that. Okay. Have you also, we talked about like product design today. Have you tried to experiment around like service design, like somebody entering a coffee shop? Have you tried to actually get something more like conceptually around like humans doing something and not so much about a product? So, I understand where that fits into your process. Like when you go into consulting and you want to say like, you know, imagine we have this scenario. And when you go to a stock photography bank, you know, you can find a lot of images that, that provide a pretty good mood or mindset for that situation that you want to encapsulate. The issue is always the rights for those stock photographies. And I can tell you the big danger for the immediate future is the profits of the stock photography industry, because you can just go into to mid journey today and you can get something that's a pretty good resolution image. If you want something that's super high resolution, you know that it needs to be like, I don't know, 30 megapixels or something like that. Even when you try to upscale it with, uh, with mid journey, with another AI upscaler, it, it's, it's going to fall short, but in many cases, just for digital screens, if you're just doing a presentation, you're going to get a high enough quality image. It's going to look photographic enough, and you're going to be able to dictate those those settings. Where I've used it is when when you're trying to reveal to a client what a great TV commercial might look like, and that's a you know you might have thirty seconds for that TV commercial, and in those thirty seconds, you're going to have maybe ten to fifteen different angles, depending on how complex that story is. And what a client normally has in my industry is a scene-by-scene -scene objective. Why do we have to spend money when you take a, a shoot that might cost, I don't know, $200,000 to go shoot this? Why do we have to, when you divide that across 10 frames, so it costs $20,000 per frame, why do we have to spend $20,000 on this frame? What's the objective there? What are we nailing down? Whether that's the, 
you know, informing the audience about how you use that product or if it's giving more of the branding codes. So when someone goes to the retail shelf, how are they going to find it and recognize the color codes that we had in, inside our TV spot? So I, I've used it in that case, and I think it's pretty strong to be able to do that. What I can say is that it's still, in my case, it's combined with a lot of Photoshop in order to get what I want. You know, Sometimes it's going to come out perfect. Sometimes I'm going to recrop, add a little logo somewhere. I might readjust the coloring that's going to be inside of there. Yeah, we're just trying to keep it like very, you know, um, easy for non-designers to use the tool. And you've, you've described that very perfectly today. Anyone can actually go and actually just get some really good uh, resolution of, of, of pictures. Um, wow. If you're still okay, we have more questions. Um, yeah, sure. Brendan, do you have one more question? I think our final question here is from Albert. Uh, he says, Eric, wonderful presentation and thank you for sharing. During thank the you, package Albert. for the presentation stage, how have your storytelling and brand strategy development with generative AI to get to create the why? Why would a customer want, want a Burberry experience on BA? Why would Burberry want this brand collaboration? He says, the images and ideas are compelling assets looking deeper what's the meaning of the burberry uh, slash you know uh, british airways collab that would tie into a new brand and product concept worth investing can chat gpt help with that you know the brand strategy narrative would it describe the starting point like i i, I interpret this ultimately as where are you going with this <laughs> like what what's how does this make sense uh, next steps no i think i think there's i didn't touch a lot on chat gpt as the as a background as far as helping you discover more what what's the power behind a lot of these ideas uh what i i think there's a where i wrote and i showed in the presentation where it says you can validate the idea at that point uh i think that there's a very great way where you can sort of check your thinking with chat gpt or bard you can if you have a concept in your mind you can say, you can go there and just say, if this was to happen, or imagine that you're a marketing director, or imagine you're creating this new, whether it's a, a product or a campaign or idea or innovation, what would be, uh, why would it work? I think is a really great, a really great question to, to AI, because it will come back with all these reasons about why. Or you can also say, why would it not work? So you can see the questions that the that the client might come up to tell you no, and you can kind of ask yourself why would it not work, and then you can create and prepare, and you can even if you if you wanted to be very lazy, you could always just ask the AI to come up with the response to those. But you're going to look a lot more knowledgeable on the topic when you've considered the the advantages and disadvantages to the idea. If you're asking me specifically about the Burberry. And British Airways idea, like the why for me, and what kind of like maybe come up with that idea. Uh, I think first of all, when I made these projects, my purpose was not to go and to sell these to Burberry and to British Airways and to become rich. Uh, in my industry, the easiest thing is often making the idea. The most difficult thing is getting to the final product, which goes on the store shelves or gets realized as a reality because of the stakeholders and maybe the legal implications and maybe the production process that is you know, months down the line. And I understood that there's a new creative director at Burberry. That was one of the reasons why it kind of activated my attention uh, to look at Burberry as, as a potential uh, brand that is a, that's in the spotlight at the moment. They had just come from last year making the Burberry uh, I think it was called Spaces. It's a TV commercial where it's people that were floating on these wires over a field. And there was so much hype around this TV commercial where these people were flying around using practical effects. And they just used like CGI to erase the wires of these people flying. So you've got this very realistic, beautiful image uh, for Burberry. And, you know, this whole sort of like flying idea I thought was very cool, how it would easily transition into British Airways. Uh, and then what I saw from British Airways is that I, there was a statistic where someone had, had told me, you know, you, you do a lot of research when you're when you're working on different brands and you have all these all this data that comes by your table. 
And one of the things that I saw was that, you know, a, a brand makes, sorry, an airlines, I, I forget what it was, but it was something like they, they earn uh, 10 times more from one first class ticket sale as far as profit goes than they earn from an economy cabin class sale. And when you read the headlines, there were so many problems with British Airways talking about cutting employees, not being able to reach revenue targets uh, for the next year. Uh, uh, a in, in, in the UK in general, a recession on the horizon coming up. And I thought, what are two real big, expensive British brands that they could capitalize on? And why would it look cool if they merged together? So I, I put all this logic together, honestly, and I wrote this out at one point, and I fed it into, uh, I fed it into ChatGPT, and I said, you know, this is this is my thinking. What in addition could support this argument? What are some other things? And one of the things that came back that I actually included in the idea when I posted it online from ChatGPT, which was a unique perspective that I didn't consider, was it pointed out to me that actually 80% of the sales for any Burberry product is generated mostly is generated by the Chinese market. And the Chinese, the way that they fly to London is in British Airways because it has a nonstop flight that goes to Shanghai. Uh, and I thought this is a great way to also with with hard data leverage the fact that this could be this could be a, a place where we can capture new uh, customers in the air and already reach an existing audience that we know it's in high demand with, and that sort of sealed the deal for me. But maybe in this presentation, I didn't double down on on a lot of the ideation. You know what happened behind there because I wanted to focus on the tool, the AI tool. But there's definitely a lot of thinking that has to happen behind the scenes, and if you want to make sure as somebody in the industry that your job is not going to be replaced, that type of thinking is super essential to, to setting up the reason why you're going to create this sort of, if it's a collaboration or, or generate this image. When you go to the client and you have that sort of thinking, they're going to say, this idea is yours. It's not from AI. And I think that's the great way to, to, to separate yourself from all this AI noise that's going on. Fantastic. Thank you, so much Thank you. For, for bringing up the, uh, the brainstorming part of ChatGPT, which is less generative AI as we meant to up in journey. If we don't have any more questions, I want to thank Eric for joining us from Hawaii. Um, thank you so much for your time. It was a great presentation. Um, if you have missed it or missed part of that, you want to share with somebody else, go to our YouTube channel probably next week or Monday or Tuesday, depending on how busy Ben is going to be this weekend. If you do want to reach out to Eric, I'm going to assume that you are reachable by some uh, media. Do you want to flash your your uh, your social media? Sure, again? I'm just gonna I'm gonna do it one more time. I'm yeah. going to share the uh, so each the thing there. Any uh, um, deeper questions, so to speak, around uh, Eric's work, or if you want to hire Eric, um, just definitely get a hold of him on LinkedIn, on Insta, on YouTube, uh, no Twitter, I guess. Um, and <laughs> Eric will, uh, will most likely be more than uh, happy to to help you through your your own uh, uh, knowledge of the generative AI. Um, yeah, if if for some reason someone needs my email, you can just go to LinkedIn. You can see my portfolio of my website that's there. You can click on it. You're gonna find if you if you dig down, you can see the email that's there. Um, but if you if you if you want to see just more deeper into my process, you can go to YouTube. I put a lot of that stuff on there. I've been getting a lot of requests for trainings to use AI. And um, I have some some classes that I'm happy to do. And uh, I'm helping some people like working with Netflix to, to uh, get more familiar with some of the tools. And if that's something that you really want, I can try to find some time for that. What I'm mostly interested in, if you have you know, access to, to an interesting project or client or, or idea. Um, I'd love to collaborate on something like that and, uh, and help you, whether it's from my background thinking, you know, because I don't think it's just about me writing prompts for you. I don't think of myself as the best prompt engineer, but I do think that the background thinking and then seeing where AI can fit into the process mm -hmm. is, is a, an extra, I don't know, improvement to the process that I can help contribute.
I have one more question that you mentioned prompts. We see on LinkedIn and other places, people are like, this is the perfect prompt. Use this prompt. Here is a list of 10 prompts. How do you feel about those? Um, try it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, what I do for myself, I have a Google document and I also have um, like a, a PowerPoint where I just take screenshots and throw it in there all the time because there's so much that's going on and I might miss it. And I can save it for later or I can earmark it or send it to myself by email. But I just, I forget so many things. And when I put it in this Google document or when I put it into this, uh, you know, on a screenshot on a, on a PowerPoint and I can see, you know, go slide by slide, I can try to reactivate my interest of this is a great prompt or here's another use case or here's how that might relate to the future when a client has a request for me and I can go back and take a look at that. I think that the best note takers are the people that internalize information and the ones that kind of know the answers to questions in the future that they might not have known, you know, natively. So I think you got to keep on trying it. And if, if you think that something uh, looks like something to, to use, I mean, obviously what's happening right now is there's so much demand for information on AI that people are using this as a great self-promotional tool, just like I am today. This is a great self-promotional tool for me. Uh, it doesn't mean that everything they're sharing is correct. And the only way that you're going to know that is by trying it out. And I've seen a lot of, of chat GPT prompts that are like, yeah, it's okay. It's not a fantastic prompt, but it's, it's okay. And uh, you're only going to know that by trying out and the seeing and comparing what the difference is. And also one thing to, to mention, of course, some people at Samsung get in trouble by feeding prompts into the AI that retains that information. So I think that Robin just uh, mentioned, like, check with your company, check the policies. There are some new uh, policies that are coming through. It's a new tool. Everybody's kind of like experimenting, learning it from it. So check with your company first. Make sure you don't go into ChatGPT and just give the machine uh, 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 proprietary uh, information that they will use for other people. So be very careful around that. Samsung got in trouble recently from putting some coding stuff in there. Eric, once again, a thousand thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Uh, this is a new tool. It's going to be here to stay. It's going to get better. So learn it, experiment with it, see what you can do with it. And hopefully we get to talk to you again soon about maybe a new tool or a new enhancement. That'd be great. I think this is the challenge to everybody who participated today. I think use this information that you've just received today while it's fresh. Uh, I think go out and try to do something, whether it's one of the tools we discussed today, or even if it's just going to that website that I mentioned at the beginning and just seeing about another AI tool that might fit your industry a bit closer. But you got to experiment with it now while this is fresh, because if you don't, in a couple of months, everything we talked about might be totally different. And if you want to be seen as on the cutting edge of your industry, this is the push that you need right now, I think, to go uh, ahead and experiment with it on that level. Excellent. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. Happy to share with you these, these new insights that I had. Cool. And we'll see you there. And thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next month with uh, Lou Rosenfeld from Rosenfeld Media. Bye, Eric. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care.